Hello, I am Jesse Weiler here for the Institute on Religious Life with Brother Didicus Godsacker. Brother, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking, Jesse. Excellent. How are you? Well, we're happy, to, we're happy to have you on the show this week, and we're very interested to learn more about your religious community and some, something about your personal vocation story. But before we start, before we begin, like we like to do a lot of things, we want to begin in prayer. So would you mind leading us in prayer? Absolutely. That'd be fine. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, we thank you for gathering us all here today uh, for this wonderful meeting uh, with Jesse and myself and all of you who are attending uh, this IRL uh, through Facebook Live or other means. Uh, we ask, Lord, that many fruits may be born out of this conversation. May many hearts be guided to you through your most sacred heart and through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. As we contemplate this month of Mary uh, and Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and all the various uh, apparitions, um, may we be guided by her uh, most loving heart, be protected by her, uh, and we pray uh, during this year of St. Joseph, uh, her most chaste spouse, uh, that we may have greater hearts directed towards uh, purity, innocence, and uh, your beatific vision. We ask this in your most holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. St. Francis of Assisi, pray, for, pray us. for us. Mary, Queen of Priests, pray, pray for us. Uh, St. Joseph, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Excellent. Well, brother, you are on your phone today, so if we have any technical difficulties, we'll, we'll just blame it uh, on that. Uh, but we are glad to have you on, <laughs> on the show today. Uh, your video keeps yeah. resizing the different shapes, so I'm trying to keep up with it on, oh. on my end. But that's totally oh. fine. Uh, well, brother, could you tell me a little bit about your vocation story, how you came to be interested in the religious life, um, and what was it about the religious life that really drew you in that, that said, you know, I'm, this is something I feel like I'm called to do? Yes. Uh, so um, it's interesting you should phrase it that way, uh, because like every vocation story, I believe it starts uh, with the home. Um, I'm grateful for my parents and my sisters. I grew up in a family of uh, five, so I have two older sisters and a mother and a father who were very diligent in taking us to church and uh, to the sacraments. Uh, while when I was growing up, uh, I was a bit of a troublemaker uh, after my baptism here. Uh, I only grew up about 30 minutes away of where I'm currently living now, so when I uh, mentioned the scripture passages about the man behind the plow, I usually tell people, well, I didn't leave the plow too far behind, but <laughs> I still felt called. So um, I, I, I want to say, first of all, I'm grateful for that uh, family unit for uh, planting the seeds and, and raising me in the faith. I think that was a good profound seed, uh, especially with my uh, grandmother. Uh, everyone believes, you know, their grandmother is a saint and uh, cultivates the virtues and uh, raises them to love the faith. Uh, so I think that's a really good starting point. Now, uh, as I was growing up, uh, I basically attended out of obedience, uh, just regularity. Uh, it wasn't really on my mind that, oh, I'd like to be a priest or I'd like to be a religious. Like so many, uh, I was just mainly trying to just um, be obedient and uh, faithful uh, to my Catholic life. Uh, it wasn't until I got to college uh, that I think my life really changed. I began to have more experiences where I encountered people uh, outside of uh, the, the Sunday Mass uh, who were drawing me into the faith. Uh, one of the groups I'd like to mention is uh, the Knights of Columbus. They really kind of draw me in and uh, taught me how to uh, become a better man and how to aspire to be a better man. Uh, the Focus Missionaries also would invite me to Bible studies. And so uh, it, it seemed like no longer was the Catholic faith just something that I was uh, living uh, at the Sunday Mass and then forgetting about it the rest of the week. Um, you know, I really wanted to carry it with me and, and take it with me. And then there were all these kinds of challenges uh, with the culture, uh, especially the secular culture that I was encountering. Uh, I felt a lot of times like a minority uh, on my campus where I was. And so uh, it, it was a big struggle. I didn't really have a lot of um, intellectual enlightenment uh, about the faith, or if I did, 
uh, when, you know, they were raising me and uh, preparing me for confirmation it had basically been lost. And so I had to learn it all over again. Um, and it wasn't until uh, that I felt the Lord stirring in my heart uh, in response to a lot of these uh, challenges that I, I started to look deeper. Uh, one of the things is that when I was 19 years old, uh, just before entering college, uh, my cousin was ordained as a priest. And that experience was uh, very profoundly moving because I had never encountered anyone uh, personally within my family or friends uh, who had uh, uh, studied at seminary and been ordained. Uh, so that was just shocking. And I felt the Lord saying, you know, what about you? Uh, do you think you would uh, be called to this life? And I said, no way. <laughs> I, I don't think so, Lord. Um, I was more interested in dating and, and following the married life. So uh, for many, this is not uh, an unconventional story. Um, uh, but it did uh, take some time to grow that seed and to cultivate and uh, find out what the Lord was calling me to. To be honest with you, I had no notion of uh, religious life when I was growing up. Uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't remember any religious visiting my parish, uh, which is only 30 minutes away from here, as I mentioned. Um, I had only known about uh, priests, and I knew about nuns too, but I'd never met any nuns. Uh, so I, I wasn't even aware that men could enter something called religious life, uh, although I had picked St. Francis as my confirmation saint, uh, only because I was really interested in plants and animals, and then uh, to find out that he ho had a whole order following behind him, and to learn uh, the depth of his transcendent virtues, uh, you know, uh, following God so obediently, so closely, giving himself all for the gospel, uh, that I felt that uh, if I was going to uh, give my life for this thing that I was so bitterly resisting at the time, uh, I wanted to just make sure my whole heart, mind, and soul was in it, as the prophet Ezekiel says. So uh, so how did you find out about this community, and, and what was it that was kind of pulling on you to like, hey, let's check this out, let's look into this? Okay, so that's very interesting. Uh, I had never really researched a lot of other communities. Uh, I had heard about the uh, Franciscans of the Eternal Word through EW10 because during this time, uh, I was in a very, uh, let's say, despairing state and just trying to rekindle my faith and look for those answers. Um, I had been kind of uh, sully, uh, sullen about uh, a, a relationship that had ended. And I was looking for uh, a path forward. Now, I don't want to mislead anybody. This wasn't like a fallback for me. It had been weighing on my mind for about uh, six or seven years at this point. And I felt, well, this is my opportunity to look into this. And uh, when I was at college, I had studied uh, global studies and international development. And so I thought, if the Lord is going to call me to use my gifts, uh, the two things I know for sure is that I think it would be best if I were to uh, work in an environment where I can interact with others on a, a global scale or um, something akin to it, even locally, uh, and then be able to practice my faith because I could see in the, the wider culture uh, that the faith was in danger. Uh, it, uh, in fact, I had been on a career path and I had received a job uh, to teach English in Japan, uh, although at that time I was a little unsure uh, where God was calling me. And then I ended up uh, leaving it behind uh, because I had heard so much in the media about uh, things like abortion going on. And I wondered, oh, you know, why isn't anyone really uh, stepping up and doing something about this? I, I didn't have, I didn't hear uh, much about that because I was only looking at the mainstream media. And so when I heard these Franciscan prior to the eternal word talking, I looked into them and I saw that uh, Franciscans were all over the world. So I thought that's really cool. Uh, they're dedicated to serving the poor and uh, just getting back to the simplicity of the gospel. And I thought, my gosh, it, isn't that just what the church needs right now is um, just going back and, um, you know, drawing people's back, hearts back to Christ uh, through mercy, through healing and forgiveness. And so uh, when I started to look around for Franciscans, I thought, well, it might be best if I uh, stay locally just for now. Uh, and uh, see where that leads me. And I typed in Franciscans in Minnesota, and I found the Franciscan Brothers of Peace. And at the time, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of things like charisms or so on and so forth. 
but I really like that they were saying, oh, yes, we're strongly committed to pro-life. I had looked into the history of our uh, two founders, which I'll get into, uh, Brother Michael and Brother Paul. They had founded at the, this community at a very young age uh, to be strong pro-life witnesses. And I thought, well, aren't all religious orders uh, pro-life? Well, this one had such a strong advocacy, it just uh, really pulled me in. And, it, and then it, at that point, when I had begun discerning with the community, uh, I had been asked, uh, because I like studying and teaching, you know, uh, do you think you'd be called to a Dominican life? I said, what's that? <laughs> but I had already set my head on being kind of boots on the ground and um, getting out on the sidewalks and being a prayer warrior and uh, to, to defend the lives of the unborn, the mothers and their fathers, and all those wounded uh, in this area. So we're so obviously this title is you know Franciscan Brothers of Peace. I want to talk about the peace mm. that you felt in your vocational discernment because I think you talk to anybody priest, religious, lay, uh, consecrated, mm. uh, single. Everyone talks about that moment of peace and understanding. So with peace being a quintessential part of your specific religious community, can you tell me a little bit about the peace that you felt in, in hearing this call and, and knowing that this is where you're supposed to be? I think the peace, yes, certainly has to be there in every vocation. Uh, I asked a lot of different people in vocations, you know, how did you know of the moment when you were called to married life or diaconate or priesthood? or uh, religious life. And that seems to be the single answer is I, I felt a peace about it. And uh, for me at that time, it was not very tangible, but there was a lot leading up to it. Uh, I just listened to a talk recently with a, a fellow TOR, TOR on YouTube. And he said, there's a lot of different stages uh, in one's discernment. And one of them is uh, experience, receiving spiritual signs and so for me, I received many spiritual signs leading up to the moment of my decision. Uh, one of them was that um, my favorite bird is a cardinal. So whenever I would see a cardinal outside, I would take it as a sign that God was moving me in the direction he wanted me to go. If I was thinking about something in a particular moment, for example, like, should I go to, back to Japan or should I enter the uh, religious brothers? You know, usually when I was thinking about one or the other, uh, a cardinal would either appear or wouldn't appear. And so I thought, my gosh, that's got to be a sign from the Lord uh, leading me. Another great sign was uh, I had no very little knowledge of the saints uh, entering in, into this life, which is kind of funny. Um, but uh, I knew a little bit about St. Francis, but the one who inspired me the most uh, was uh, Blessed Solanus Casey, He's a local here in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. Uh, and he, his journey was so similar to my own. Um, he, wa he wanted to get uh, engaged or married to a woman named Rebecca Tobin, and it, it didn't work out as well as he uh, had planned. And uh, he really did not feel like he should join the Capuchins, but he uh, presented himself uh, before the Blessed Mother, and she felt, he felt her calling him, you know, go to Detroit, go to Detroit. And he knew the Capuchins were there. And so uh, that became an integral part of my spiritual journey. I, he was the first biography of a saint I read. And then when I was praying one day with my mother, uh, we hadn't prayed the rosary in about 13 years since my grandmother died. She pulled out my grandfather's Roman Missal, and she pulled out a holy card that was inside. And she said, son, do you know who this is? And I said, yes, that's Blessed Solanus Casey. I'm reading his biography right now. And I really felt uh, that the Lord was speaking to me so directly there. Um, so that kind of led up. Then when I arrived at the Franciscan Brothers of Peace and had uh, my come and see visit, which for those of you who don't know, it's just like a week long stay uh, where you can kind of see if uh, you may be feeling called to apply to the community. Um, I prostrated myself uh, before the uh, San Damiano cross, which you can see behind me here. Uh, and I, I didn't really know much of the history of it. Uh, in fact, it looked like a very unusual cross to me, but there was such a profound sense of peace uh, that washed over me. And uh, I don't want to make it seem like a fairy tale in any way, but just like the light was streaming through. Um, I got kind of the, the light fuzzies, and um, it just felt like the Lord had said, this is where I want you. Uh, so I did my best uh, to resign. 
to his most holy will and like our blessed mother give my fiat well with all those cardinals that you saw maybe maybe you were supposed to be a bishop of a major diocese of uh of the world you never know <laughs> well actually i'm i'm thinking uh you know brother paul his favorite bird was also a cardinal so i think that he was really interceding for me in a powerful way <laughs> well that's great uh okay so so we have a strong connection from you to the to the Franciscan spirituality and then in, into this community and some of the saints and some of the people involved. But what is this community? What are the charisms? What's so important about the Franciscan Brothers of Peace that people need to know about? Right. Um, so if you would allow me, I'd like to just go through uh, some visual aids here I have. I think it's always helpful for people. So here's a picture of our uh, brotherhood. This is our primary uh, facet of our vocation is to live in community and to pray together. Uh, we pray together four times a day, uh, morning, afternoon, evening with adoration and our night compline. And then we'll usually have a meal together to promote a community. So we're really like a, a big family. Um, of course, we uh, desire to live the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience uh, and uh, follow in the footsteps of St. Francis. We are a uh, third order regular for those who are familiar with it. Uh, it's mainly dedicated to a life of, of penance uh, and preaching penance and living penance and mercy. Um, so we have about 10 brothers right now. And initially the community was founded uh, in the spirit of St. Francis to serve the poor. Uh, so we actually have a food shelf, which I'll uh, show you some pictures later. And uh, th that's how it started out with uh, two founding brothers, Brother Michael and uh, Gaworski and Brother Paul O'Donnell. They both were in the seminary together, uh, but they ended up discerning out, and Brother Michael was looking around for different religious communities, but none of the charisms seemed to fit right. Uh, so he actually approached a conventual uh, who, is also living, who was also living in Minnesota, and his name was Father Urban Wagner, and he sort of became a spiritual director for our community. Uh, he, uh, it's, it's fascinating that, to me that he didn't just uh, say, hey, you know, Brother Michael, why don't you join us? Uh, he saw that something was very uh, special going on uh, with with uh, his calling at uh, just 24 years of age, if you can believe it. And um, Brother Michael and Brother Paul sort of started getting involved in uh, pro-life issues. For example, uh, they would go out to the uh, abortion clinics, and at that time, uh, they would do sit-ins. And just before uh, the community kind of developed, they helped found pro-life action ministries which is a widespread uh, organization in the United States uh, dedicated to sidewalk counseling and prayer warriors. Um, and the reason they uh, adopted sidewalk counseling is because the sit-ins did not tend to be very sustainable. Uh, they would often get arrested. <laughs> and, uh, they had no, no brothers or no volunteers to be out there. So uh, sidewalk counseling, you know, helps give the information to people who are in crisis pregnancies. And then uh, the, the charism began to develop from there. They began uh, to be known as like the pro-life brothers. Uh, it's not the reason they founded the community, but it uh, started to become uh, so central to us. And uh, Brother Michael, unfortunately, succumbed to uh, a form of pneumonia and was put into a coma for about 12 years with his brothers uh, caring for him. And Brother Paul was among them. When Brother Michael passed away, uh, Brother Paul began to be involved in the uh, Terry Scheibel incident, for those of you who are familiar. Uh, that was happening around 2005, uh, just around the time of John Paul's death. And it was an incident where uh, she, uh, her husband and uh, her family were battling because uh, she, they want, the family wanted to keep the feeding tube in her mouth and um, her husband wanted it uh, removed. And uh, it created a, a national, uh, actually a global controversy. And Brother Paul acted as a spiritual advisor uh, for that trip. And he would go down once a month uh, to visit with her and uh, offer consolation and support. And then there were a number of other things like um, when they were at a, an abortion clinic one time, they found 13 babies in a dumpster, which are now buried at a resurrection cemetery nearby we visit every year. And Brother Paul gave names to each of the 13 babies. So um, the pro-life uh, charism is very much ingrained. And in fact, uh, we, when we share 
with people what our charism is. We say uh, we follow in uh, the footsteps of John Paul II's encyclical, uh, the Gospel of Life, Evangelium Vitae. So uh, it seems like this was kind of a natural formation of this community and that that the Holy Spirit was right along with these guys, kind of just showing them this is what this is going to be. What is it like to be part of an organization that seems to be so touched by the Spirit in, in the way that it's being guided and led? I mean, this is, a, this is not coincidence, any of this. I mean, it's, there's a purpose right. to all of it, right? Yes. It's, it's all providence. And um, it's interesting because we've seen, I mean, I haven't personally met either of the founders. I'm the first brother to join uh, who has not met either of the founders. Uh, but I have uh, witnessed just through reading and through my own experience of how this charism has developed. Uh, it's mainly focused or oriented towards the, um, uh, digni the dignity of life, protecting the dignity of life. Uh, so often we think of abortion or uh, assisted suicide. Those are very clear examples. But then also the brothers are uh, dedicated to things like uh, helping victims of torture or uh, Karen refugees. Karen are refugees from Burma. If you've uh, been watching the news within the past few months, you might have seen uh, that Burma is under great turmoil right now, uh, fighting uh, for their uh, to retain their independence and freedom. Uh, we assist a lot of the uh, Karen refugees, and these all come together. It's very Eucharistic uh, in, in being able to see the dignity of the human person. Uh, and it's just, uh, if you treat any one of these uh, things separately, uh, it, it can be hard to see the connection. They could even be seen as uh, political issues. So that was something that was striking to me when I uh, joined this order was, uh, um, you know, instead of going into politics, you know, joining a religious life, I could see that uh, there there were no uh, boundaries, there are no no limitations on saying uh, you know this is a, a conservative or this is a liberal issue. No, this is all we're integrating um, the value of the human life and and fighting to protect it as uh, we we value the Eucharist. So you mentioned that uh, your community has been advocating publicly in different situations and and also being public advocates of pro-life issues out there. So what, it, what are the actual day-to-day -day activities that you're doing and mission work that you're doing uh, to actually enact all of this stuff to bring about peace uh, to, a, to a world that so desperately needs it? Okay, so it's going to uh, vary from day to day. I actually have some pictures of some of our apostolates here um, I'd like to share with you. So, um, one second here. One of the things I mentioned is that we do a, a food shelf, and we have that um, every Monday, an emergency food shelf, uh, and we serve a lot of the poor and the homeless. Uh, there's about a couple of brothers who work on that. And, uh, oh, here we go. Here's a picture of it. Um, here's just a look at uh, all the different bags of food we pile up. So uh, we kind of have a system where about um, 20 or 30 families will come visit us in the local area. And that we not only uh, just give them their bread or their water for the day, uh, like, you know, the uh, uh, scripture passage says in St. Paul, you know, don't just uh, say goodbye and good luck, keep warm and well fed. You know, we uh, incorporate our prayer in, into the, uh, the ministry, the apostolate, and um, we are always asking for their requests or their intentions and trying to build up a, a basis of spirituality and not just, uh, you know, material benefit. Uh, the material benefit is intended to uh, elevate the spirit. Um, so uh, that's one example. Uh, we also have brothers who are involved in uh, VA ministry. So the VA is a medical center uh, in Minneapolis where they care for veterans. And we have one or two brothers particularly devoted to that. Uh, and one of them is named Brother John Mary. And so here's a picture. And he's been serving there for about 15 or 20 years. And one of the things that we do there is we uh, help celebrate them uh, or uh, serve at the NAS and we bring uh, Eucharistic communion to people. Um, 
as I mentioned, sidewalk counseling still continues with a couple of brothers. We have brothers praying out at the sidewalks. Uh, the Koran apostolate is also uh, very fruitful. It's probably our biggest apostolate right now. And Father Seraphim Worth is our one priest of the community. Uh, he was ordained two years ago. He is a chaplain of the Koran community. Uh, he speaks some of the Koran language and he brings the sacraments uh, to the Koran people uh, and has house prayers with them. Uh, so there's a few examples of uh, ways that we're involved and engaged with others. Now, if somebody's interested in looking into the Franciscan Brothers of Peace or some of the things that you, you're working on and that you're doing, where can they go to find out some more information about this? Uh, well, there's a couple of sources that I'd recommend. Uh, one is www.brothersofpeace.org. That's our main website. Uh, you can find out more information about us. You can see uh, newsletter articles that have been uploaded. Uh, I also recommend that you check out, and everyone here, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have plenty of videos detailing uh, our apostolates, our community life, everything from prayer to mass uh, to uh, some of the work that we're involved in uh, can be found on that site. And you had mentioned something earlier to me about the, this Maria Cannon mission. What is that? Yes. Okay, great. I'm glad you asked. So uh, that's a personal apostolate that I've been involved in. Uh, one, as I mentioned, one of the things that I said to the Lord uh, when I was discerning with the Franciscan Brothers of Peace was like, okay, Lord, if you want this, I, I have to be fully prepared uh, to let go of my, my dream or my vision uh, to study or to teach in Japan. And so uh, I was like, it's going to be worth it. Uh, because of, you know, all the things that uh, are needed to build up this kingdom. Well, the Lord rewarded me a hundredfold. Anytime you give something to him, he rewards you a hundredfold. And so uh, he wanted me to remain in uh, uh, Japanese uh, apostolate ministry. Like Maximilian Kolbe, uh, we give out miraculous medals. Uh, if you visit our website, uh, it's run by a, a lay Carmelite. So it's not directly uh, connected with the Franciscan Brothers of Peace, but I am involved in it. Uh, it's called Maria Cannon with a K, uh, K A N N O N, mission.com. Um, and you can reach out to us, and we have uh, miraculous medals and pamphlets available in the Japanese language. It's the first time produced outside of English and French. So it's pretty uh, a neat thing. We would love to have you support us. Um, may, one of the main reasons we're doing it is because, uh, just like in the United States, Japan experiences a lot of spiritual poverty. And so it can be a good message for all of us um, to get back to uh, turning ourselves to God. The, the um, Japanese martyrs uh, that were persecuted and killed for their faith can bear a great witness or example uh, for us today. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time today. We're fortunate, unfortunately, uh, this is only a half hour show, but we'll have to have you back on to talk oh, some more about this. But this has been incredibly enlightening, very fascinating. Uh, to, to hear that there are some religious communities that are really fighting the good fight for pro-life issues, but not just one pro-life issue, all of human dignity issues. And so thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I've posted all those little website links in the chat and people can uh, check those out. So, so Brother Didicus, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to talk to you again soon. Oh, thanks be to God. Thank you all. Uh, let us keep each other in prayer. God bless. God bless.